KP's video news, y'all. It's KP's video news, y'all. It's KP's video news, y'all. It's KP's video news, y'all. KP's video news, y'all. It's KP's video news, y'all. That's right. It's KP's video news, y'all. Yes, indeed. Okay. How's everybody going? Doing over there? And congratulations to the Dodgers uh, for securing uh another spot in the playoffs i think this is like what 10 out of 12 years they they have made it made it to the playoffs they clinched their division wow congratulations to the dodgers and uh and i also have to say welcome to the pac 12 to dion dion and the boys over there in colorado welcome to the pac 12 man you got your official welcome yesterday Having to deal with uh, the Oregon Ducks, everybody already know what what the Ducks programs look like. So you guys are gonna have to uh, review the tapes, look at the tapes, see what happened. I think you guys are a little bit undersized personally, but I digress. Welcome to the Pac-12, Dion. Yep. So hey, I'm gonna dive right in, folks, right here. I have uh, three black students who were instrumental in developing the first COVID-19 shots. And it was a meeting that changed their lives forever. It, the year was 2020, and reports had emerged from China that they had never before seen coronavirus was spreading quickly, sickening hundreds of people and, and turning deadly. More than 7,000 miles away in Bethesda, Maryland, tensions were high in Dr. Uh, Dr. Graham's lab at the Vaccine Research Center of the National Institutes of Health. He convened a meeting of the lab scientists who are developing vaccines for other types of respiratory viruses. Among about two dozen scientists in Graham's lab were three young students. Uh, Alipocola, Abiona, Jeffrey Hutchison, and Cynthia Ziwawo. They were sitting in that meeting. Dr. Graham said, it's time to start thinking about running the drill, said Hutchison, now 33 and a fourth-year doctoral student at University of Washington. At the Vaccine Center, the mindset is sort of like anytime there's something like that spreading, you can uh, use it as an opportunity for a drill and a drill for the big one. It's going to be a real pandemic, he stated. The drill consisted of Abiona and Hutchison making lab versions of this novel coronavirus protein, as with other types of coronaviruses, the scientists knew that this one carried a structure called a, a spike protein, which is used to enter human cells and cause infections. Next, the protein went to Ziwawo, who tested the, the kind of immune responses a vaccine would elicit in response to it. We knew we, uh, we were doing things that were important. But then it was like, oh, wow, this is really big, Ziwawo said. And then Fauci is coming to the lab. Shortly after the official drill was launched, Dr. Fauci, then director of the National Institute of Aller Allergy and Infectious Diseases, announced to the world that NIH was working on a vaccine against the coronavirus, part of an existing collaboration with biotechnical uh, company Moderna. What the world didn't know at the time was that those three students, Abiona, Hutchison, and Zuawo, were being were doing the foundation work for those vaccines and to eventually save lives. It was all hands on deck. Abiona, Hutchison, and Zuawo worked under renowned immunologist uh, Kizumi, Kizumi, uh, Mikia Corbett, then an NHI senior research fellow who guided them through their experiments and testing. The students hadn't known each other before working together in the lab. At that point, it was all hands on deck and we were ready to go, Corbett said, of developing the Moderna COVID-19 vaccines, adding that the team felt confident and trusted each other through their work. The work 
that these four people did in particular I think has been unappreciated, underappreciated, and somewhat heroic. Uh, Graham stated, who was deputy director of the Vaccine Research Center and the chief of viral uh, uh, pathogenesis laboratory at the time. Their work led not just to Moderna vaccine rapidly entering clinical trials, but also to the discovery of the uh, monoclonal antibodies that were used for treatments and informed the development of other coronavirus vaccines as well. Graham, who is now a professor at Morehouse College School of Medicine and inaugural director of the school's newly announced David uh, Sachter Global Health Equity Institute, added that he made an effort to select a cohort of scientists in his lab who reflected the diversity of the rest of the United States in race, ethnicity, and background. When he brought in, a, in different people in his lab from different backgrounds and zip codes and ethnicities, he had the opportunity to, to engage with them and understand how they think about science and how they would apply their discoveries and how those discoveries would be integrated into the community differently. Yep. So they're going to ask questions from different lenses because of the differences they've experienced throughout life. The need for greater diversity in medicine has been an ongoing challenge for the scientific community, but only about 5.7 of physicians in the United States are black or African American, according to the data from the Association of American Medical Colleges and communities they serve. They estimate 12% of the U.S. population is black, black or African American. Aviona Hutchinson and Zuawo are, are, are well aware of the lack of diversity in science and medicine, and this week they reunited in person for the first time since working together in that NIH lab during the early days of the COVID-19 pandemic. They uh, discussed it and their own journeys to where they are today, including working hard in school, learning lessons when lab experiments failed, and, and uh, chasing curiosity. Yep, and their nostalgia quickly turned to lab. Uh, laughter when Aviona joked that after she left the NIH, NIH she felt that her life mirrored that uh, of the Disney Channel's Hannah Montana, a fictional character with a double life as a typical teenager by day, a famous pop singer at night. And she described herself as a medical student by day and a COVID vaccine researcher by night, finishing some of the pivotal work produced at one of the most renowned labs in the world and helping develop a life-saving vaccine. In record time, so there's three young black students, man, that helped create the uh, coronavirus COVID-19 vaccine. Yep. Wow. That's amazing. And these people have been widely and widely ignored and uh, have not been seen. They have not been seen. And, you know, it's, it's, it's really a sad, a sad situation, man. You know, just like the hidden figures, hidden figures, uh, in uh, you know, that help that help the space program. They help the space program, uh, get off the ground. If it wasn't for the the black people that were involved in that, that whole space program, never would have got off the ground. Period. But now, then you hear about these things years, decades later, decades. You know, so it's, it's, it's just a, you know, it's just the way we, you know, this country functions, man. We try to hide the people that are instrumental in doing, the, doing things in this country when they don't look uh, like what they think the status quo should be. And, you know, just as a sidebar, I'm really, I'm really wondering how many people would have taken the COVID vaccine had they known that three black people were instrumental in creating the COVID vaccine, how many people out of ignorance would have refused to uh, take the vaccine? How many, you know, black, white, Asian, Hispanic, people of all nationalities, how many of those people would have refused to take the COVID vaccine if they would have known that black people were the ones that were instrumental and helping to create the vaccine. I wonder. Well, and that was Moderna. It turns out Moderna was the best, the best, uh, 
the best COVID vaccine out of, out of all of them. Yep. So, hey, congratulations. And they deserve their credit where credit is due. Okay. So, uh, the DA's office, they had a DA's office in uh, Philadelphia. Philadelphia District Attorney's Office has filed a motion asking the court to revoke revoked the bail of a former police officer, Mark Dow, who was charged with first-degree murder in the shooting death of Eddie Irizarry. The highly unusual move, Dow was released on bail last week after bail commissioner uh, placed his bail at $500,000 for the 27-year-old. It was only $50,000 was needed to post, and it was by, by the, uh, paid by the police union. And in the state of Pennsylvania, judges do not set bail when someone is charged with murder because it carries an automatic life sentence. Thou shot Irizarry six times while sitting in his car with the windows rolled up on August 14th, and there was, there was a knife found next to him inside the car with the windows rolled up. Neighborhood surveillance video and police warn uh, camera footage of the, of, of the incident dispute the initial police narrative that Irizarry was standing outside of his car and lunged at the responding officers. The bail commissioner, whose sole purpose is to set defendant's bail on state guidelines that said prosecutors shouldn't Monday morning quarterback the decision of the police officer, and the bail hearing is set for Tuesday. And, uh, wow, that's crazy. That is crazy, man. You know, the guy was inside the car. Cops shot him. He was inside the car, inside, never, never attempted to get out of the car, sitting in the car. So he wasn't, he was no threat. He was absolutely positively no threat. So on to our next story here. It was a black, a black man, uh, this past, this last week, as a matter of fact, that was, uh, acquitted of murder charges. And uh, even though the victim was killed by the police in Georgia, in a case that self-defense laws characterizes overreaching prosecution. And Rashawn Brown was found not guilty of Latoya James, who was, who was, uh, who was shot during a, a botched police raid in Camden County more than two years ago. And James was, uh, lost her life while sleeping on the couch in Brown's home, May 4th, 2021, when deputies serving a search warrant for drugs in early morning, used a battering ram to knock Brown's door and open fire. So this past week, uh, the case, this Georgia case bore a number of similarities to a, a botched no-knock warrant that led to police shooting of Breonna Taylor in 2020 in Louisville, Kentucky. In that case, police kicked in the apartment door while Taylor and her boyfriend were asleep. And uh, so it was a similar situation. But anyway, the uh, uh, Brown, the jurors found Brown guilty of possession with intent to distribute uh, drugs and aggravated assault. But lawyers said they planned to appeal those convictions, and he, but he did not get, get uh, charged, charged with the uh, uh, demise of his girlfriend. So you got some south, south side, people on the south side of Chicago are, are upset and angry that the Cook County spent $14 million to purchase suburban hotels to un, uh, shelter uh, unhoused people to shelter them in, on the north side, north side of town. So the Cook County has allocated substantial investment around $14 million to acquire two suburban hotels aiming to provide housing and support for an unhoused population in addition to become parts of a broad, broader effort to tackle homelessness and create stable living conditions for those in need. The county commissioner are backing the plan that could see Cook County purchase these hotels and repurpose them as shelters for the unhoused. This move is in response to the pressing issue of homelessness that has been exacerbated by various economic and social factors, and the initiative comes as part of a broader effort to tackle homelessness and provide a safe and stable environment for those in need. So finally, you figure the state of uh, Illinois and, and uh, Cook County which is where Chicago is, made a decision to try to do something to help the homeless population when they have been going, uh, turning flips and jumping head over heels to help the 
uh, influx of the Ukrainian Ukrainian uh, exiles or whatever. I don't know what you would call, would call them, what you would actually consider to call them. Refugees, I guess you would call them refugees. Uh, and so they, therefore they have been getting an influx of them that have been sent from places like Florida and Texas that have been sent to uh, Chicago for some odd reason. A lot of people, you got a lot of a lot of immigrants being sent to Chicago, and you also have the Ukrainians. But it's I think it's really about time that the people in this country take care of the people that are already here first. The people that are already here first. I mean, if you can take care of all of them at the same time, do that. But don't just push or, or neglect the homeless people that are out there that are really truly destitute. And in uh in and then uh make all these accommodations for the immigrants and the uh, Ukrainian refugees and push the people that are already American citizens to the side and not do anything for them. So this situation is is going on in in Chicago, New York, L.A., and a lot of other cities that predominantly mostly have black mayors. That's that's where they that's where these people. Are being sent to, uh, and the so-called sanctuary cities. Now, the South Side, uh, uh, Commissioner Stanley Moore, whose district includes parts of the South South Side Chicago and the southern suburbs, said, uh, "In in my district, I have babies sleeping on floors. I have children sleeping on cardboard boxes. And families that are sleeping in in garages. And my issue comes when we're spending this type of money in communities that don't share." The same amount of the homeless population that we have. Yep. Carl Wolf, who serves executive director, respond now an organization in the southern uh, uh, suburban area of Chicago Heights that offers food and housing assistance, stated that the majority of calls received by county suburban homelessness prevention call center originate from ten out of the eleven communities located in the southern suburbs. So ten out of the eleven communities are located in the southern suburbs, but they're trying to make this uh, make this situation happen in the north in the north on the north side of town. So the people on the south side are pretty upset about this whole situation. In addition, the nonprofit organization Suburban South Suburban Pass currently operates a hotel based shelter program that offers one hundred to one hundred and fifty beds every night. And this program has seen significant demand with a waiting list that exceeds 100 individuals seeking shelter. So, these, you know, they need help, man. They really need help trying to do something to help these people get some of the things that they need, man. Wow, that's really bad. It's really a bad situation in this country. Really, a really bad situation, man. So, you know, I'm going I'm to end the story on that, on that note. And uh, don't forget to, you know, don't forget to subscribe and don't forget to hit that notification bell. And don't forget to comment, like, comment, and share this uh, KP's video news here. Yep. Okay, folks. Yep. It's KP's video news, Sunday edition. KP's video news, y'all. KP's video news, y'all. It's KP's video news, y'all. Yep. You know who it is. KP Video News Show.